Did you know that most solar heating suppliers in the UK don't give you a very wide choice of what kind of solar heating is around? And nor do many of the independent agencies who purport to be independent because they are, their concepts of what they think of as solar is usually an established old technology. What I'm trying to do here is to drop the scales from people's eyes because there's a much wider agenda of solar. It's not an established technology, or it isn't just. There are lots and lots of fascinating innovations coming in, and I'm going to cover just a few of them here. Technically, there are several areas to look at. Plumbing, solar collectors, circulation, and the basic concept behind them all need looking at. So we're going to jump into some of those areas now. Let's start with the plumbing. Traditionally, there are two kinds of plumbing into solar, for solar, into twin series cylinders and twin coil cylinders. Both need to be replaced and both bring with them a heightened risk of Legionella. Not a huge risk because there'd be epidemics that would be recorded by now, but there appears to be a risk of about 10 times higher. The wider agenda includes heat to base hot water cylinders, direct or indirect, which can often be retrofits of solar heating systems to existing solar heating systems, existing hot water systems. That's really handy. And there are also thermal stores which give high pressure water, free feeding to combis, and have the best uh, safety record in terms of Legionella, theoretically at least. In terms of solar collectors, there are typically three groups, three groups, but in fact there are a couple more. There are concentrating collectors coming in, probably mainly most suited to areas where there's a lot of direct sunlight and not too much cloud, but the, there is some debate on this. And um, there are freeze-tolerant flat plates like Solar Twin, I've got a vested interest here, like Solar Twin provide. They are solar collectors that can freeze solid without cracking, and if you type in Solar McGregor on the web, you'll see some other videos about that. So the benefits of not using antifreeze are that you can replace it with water, and water is six times less sticky. Six times less sticky means six times less power used for your pump, and we'll see in a moment that this is really important. In terms of circulating the water through a solar collector or antifreeze, the co conventional ways are considering thermosiphon, that's sometimes called gravity circulation. You get them in, in many of the southern European systems. Or you can have forced circulation, and that is usually on-off or in high speed and mains powered. That's the conventional solar approach, but once again, there's a lot more happening in the real world. There are variable speed pumps going in, and they can match the speed of the water going off, antifreeze going through the solar collector, to the sun, sunlight intensity, so the water can spend the right time to heat up properly and not spend too long or too low in the collector. There are also a variety of different thoughts on what flow speeds you should have through solar collectors. Some people say fast, that you extract every little degree that you can. Some say slower, because you can use lower powered pumping and get bigger temperature rises. Really, it's horses for courses. And in terms of the power for the pump, you can have mains electric or PV powered. Generally speaking, PV powered is more reliable. Then if you look at the concept, don't get knocked out by this, we'll go into it in more detail in a moment. There are plenty of different areas to look at. Conventional wisdom on the left is that you have sealed, pressurised solar heating systems with antifreeze, glazing for glass, glass for glazing, switch the pump off if it gets too hot, replace your cylinders, and of course what you've done is, what's been happening in the past is the best. It's all this sort of strange, you know, what we've done is the best, therefore the future never could be. I don't think it's really the right way to go. There's also a requirement for installers to be highly qualified with high pressure plumbing and electric skills, and never to discuss Legionella. We've been told to shut up. Nor to mention operating costs, maintenance costs, coefficient of energy performance, more about that in a minute, carbon clawback, life cycle analysis and so on. And there's this bizarre focus on panel efficiency per square metre when it doesn't really matter, or things like solar fraction. In reality, there's a lot more that can be looked at. Let's look at some of them. Let's look at overheat control. Overheat control for solar heating systems can actually be three ways. You can switch a pump off which is not always a brilliant thing to do if it's full of antifreeze, because the antifreeze can degrade in the middle of summer when you're on holiday when that happens. Another way to do it is to collect the energy when it's hot and to dump it back into the sky at night or in the morning. And that's done, that's called heat export, and that's what is quite is what most solar controllers can do, but don't always do. Some systems drain down, they just take the anti the antifreeze out or the water out. In terms of retrofitting solar heating systems, there are three options currently on the UK market. There's internal heat exchangers, external heat exchangers, and fitting direct, which is what Solar Twin does. There are also some interesting issues on, on Legionella, as I've mentioned before. In terms of plumbing options, probably the, the least safe is twin series cylinders. 
then the next is a normal twin coil cylinder, then back to roughly the same risk levels as conventional plumbing, which most people would regard as acceptable, are retrofitting to existing heat to base hot water cylinders, because the ones I mentioned before don't heat to the base and don't kill the bugs perhaps as often as they should. And then at the top of the list you've got thermal stores. Thermal stores really are very, very efficient in terms of getting rid of Legionella because they've got very low stored volumes and very high water turnovers. Then there are various cost and efficiency ratios, and an interesting one to look at is the, the coefficient of energy performance. If you were to buy a heat pump, you'd plug it into mains electric, and you'd maybe, you'd maybe get two or three or four kilowatt hours of heat brought in by your pump for every one kilowatt hour that you actually plugged into the mains. That's not bad. But for solar heating, it's even better. It's about 12 to 1 for a mains pump system. In other words, you get 12 units of heat for every one unit of electricity that you put in, which means you get a net energy benefit of about 11, which isn't too bad. But what's fascinating is you can actually improve that even further because the mains, the, the, pump, the power supply for the pump of a solar heating system can be uh, pumped by an on-site photovoltaic panel. Then you've got an infinite coefficient of performance and all the heat you get is yours in the sense that it's not negated by your electricity bill. What's interesting is that this 1 to 12 approximate carbon uh, energy clawback in a typical house where mains gas is being saved as a fuel equates to a 20%, in other words a 1 in 5 carbon clawback. In other words, for every 5 kilos of carbon that you think you're saving by having your gas boiler switched off, in reality you are burning one, you're losing 1 kilo of carbon at the power station, which is um, powering the mains pump for a solar hot water system. Get rid of mains pumps is the solution. Another piece of nonsense that happens, and there are lots, a lot of nonsense in the solar heating industry, um, but is panel efficiency per square meter. That would really only matter if you were short of space, and nobody really is. Most solar heating installations are between two and six square meters on homes. Now, if you had a roof with two or six square meters, it wouldn't even be the size of a double bed or virtually. So you'd, you know, you'd be living in a shed. So if you want to pay extra for a panel which is more efficient per square meter, please do, but remember that you might be paying £1,000 extra to see a row of roof tiles. Why not spend that money on other energy efficiency measures in your house, or just something simple like a nice picture to go on the wall? Better to look at than some roof tiles. And the other interesting thing to look at is the system or component performance concept. Most people think that solar panels are the most important thing to look at in terms of effectiveness of design. It's not the case. You've got to look everywhere. You can lose heat all over a solar heating system, or you can simply not gain it in the first place. One thing that's happening in Austria is people are putting in south-facing vertical panels on the side of apartments. That sacrifices a summer surplus of sun, because if you imagine the sun is a low angle in winter, for low angle winter gain. They get a flatter performance across the year, and with oversized panels, they can actually get rid of more bought-in energy, saving more money, saving the environment. Another aspect of focusing on system performance is to look at pipe sizes. A lot of solar heating systems have fat pipes between the solar store and the solar collector. That's not a good idea, because those pipes have big surface areas and big volumes. So every time the pump stops, a lot of heat is lost. I hope this is useful. Lots and lots of more ideas in here. Feel free to stop the video. If you look at the variety of solar heating systems in Britain, there's lots using water as a heat transfer fluid. There are thousands of freeze-tolerant collectors fitted in the UK. There are open-vented systems as well as closed. Heat export is a standard option in many, in many solar controllers. Polymer glazing is getting increasingly common. PV pumps are increasingly common, as are variable speed pumps. And more and more people, for safety reasons, are heating to the base of hot water cylinders, either by designing the cylinders that way or by putting in shunt pumps. Microball pipes are a great idea. Heat exchanger retrofits are great, as are direct ones. And more and more people are using thermal stores. As a customer, see if you can compare the safety operational costs, maintenance costs, including antifreeze, carbon emissions and net energy savings and life cycle impacts of technologies. It's hard to get the figures. We've tried to get as many as we can at Solar Twin, but you know, challenge us to, uh, to give us the, the answers and see how much you get from other people. Thanks a lot from Barry Johnston.